Good evening, Hayden Bible Church. Uh, it's a wonderful time for us to get together again and just to worship the Lord and the beauty and splendor of His holiness. And I want to read out of uh, Psalm 99. It's a pretty short psalm, so I'm going to read that to you. But all the songs we're singing this evening are talking about God's glory and that He reigns and that He's in charge of our lives. And so as we, we uh, listen, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 99. I'm doing it in the ESV. The Lord our God is holy. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his mighty might loves justice. You have established equity. You have uh, executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was also among those who called upon his name. They called the, to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statutes that he gave to them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. And here we are worshiping a holy God as we look at the words of the song, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In my Redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul. My God, like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. Your grace, oh well, too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heaven's reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom, my highest good and my unending need. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, Strong defender of my weary heart and my sword to fight the cruel deceiver and my shield against his hateful dark. My song when enemies surround me, and my hope when tides of sorrow rise my joy when trials are abounding your faithfulness my refuge in the night oh lord my rock and my redeemer, gracious Savior of my ruined life, my guilt, a cross laid on your shoulders, in my place you suffered, bled, and died. You rose the grave and death a conquered. You broke my bonds of sin and shame And you rose the grave and death a conquer You broke my bonds of sin and shame And O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer May all my days Glory to your name. 
Pastor Sean has asked for a song to be sung for, I think, probably two years now. And we're going to try and do that tonight. We're going to introduce the song called He Reigns, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I know that some of the uh, folks at our church uh, are familiar with this song. And so what I'd like to do is I'm going to sing the first verse in the chorus, and then I'll invite you to sing along with me the first verse, chorus, then second chorus, and we'll finish the song that way. Very simple melodies, so just follow along with me. that goes. Sing with me the first. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty. He alone is worthy. Awesome Lord, mighty King. He reigns through all the universe. His glory covers all the earth, His power displayed in mighty works, and we proclaim Him as our Lord and King. Verse 2, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. He reigns in power and glory. There's a name above all names. He reigns through all the universe. His glory covers all the earth. His power displayed in mighty works. And we proclaim Him as our Lord and King. Sing the chorus again. He reigns through all the universe. His glory covers all the earth. His power displayed in mighty works, and we proclaim Him as our Lord and King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy our Lord God Almighty. A wonderful song talking about a holy God. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again sing that again and I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because 
you died and you rose again. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. In all I do, I honor you. You are my King. You are my King. You are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again. Amazing love how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Amazing love. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. Father, we want to thank you for your amazing love that you have proven over and over to the church. To the world, Lord, that you exist, that you're alive. The grave is empty. Father, we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to dive into God's Word tonight, to look at what you would have us to hear tonight. And Father, we do just ask that you would just be with every listener, Lord, that the church will be moved to do your will, Lord, that the church will be moved to uh, help their neighbor. The church will be moved to love one another, not to separate, Lord, in this time of chaos and also just uh, personal separation just from folks as we're being told. But Lord, help us to remember to keep our eyes focused on you, our author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to hear from your word. I pray for Pastor Sean as he breaks the bread of life this evening with us. I pray, Lord, that you will teach us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, Hayden Bible Church. I'm so excited. I hope that uh, the time of worship um, just helped you to rejoice in the Lord tonight. And I want to, uh, I just really have a privilege tonight to share from the Lord's Word. And before we do that, let's uh, just ask Him for a blessing over our time. Father, we're so excited today that uh, you gave us Bibles. We have the unchanging, reliable Word of God right in our possession today. Some of us sitting at home with it in our laps, some of us here at uh, the church building, um, but Lord, it's the same Word. It doesn't change. And thank you that you blessed us with that, Lord. Tonight as we open your Word and we uh, endeavor to, to learn from you uh, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, uh, as you promised, would be here to be our teacher, 
I pray that in every heart, in every living room, on every uh, cell phone, on every iPad or laptop, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be present there teaching into the depths of the heart tonight, Lord. Thank you for this precious word. Uh, We acknowledge that nothing spiritual can happen tonight unless you're the one that does that, as we'll see. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. So I'm so glad that we get to be together tonight. And again, I hope that uh, any of the times that we have here, I, I pray and hope that they bless your heart and help you rejoice in the Lord uh, as you're um, sequestered during this pandemic. And, and uh, as strange and in, in some ways as frustrating and, and difficult as these current times have, have been, the truth is, is that we're also experiencing many blessings. And I know you, could, you would probably attest to that. I've seen many of you attest to that on different places like Facebook. And I've been experiencing blessings like being so sick of watching TV that I actually, every once in a while, turn it off and enjoy my family. Or that maybe we just have a quiet time in the house where we're reading or just visiting with each other. And I know many of you, like our wonderful women's ministry, have been reaching out to encourage the saints like never before. And also many of you have been in a refreshed way, attentive to the needs of your next door neighbors, right in your same neighborhood. And during the, so during this strange time, some of us have been used in ways that we have never expected. In the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, you, we're finding out that the that gospel ministry has a way broader view than we actually ever thought. And we're noticing new ways that the Lord Jesus gets to use us for his special purposes because he's set us apart for that holy work. In our passage tonight, we're going to see ways the Lord was using the ministry of John the Baptist and and a group of his disciples. And we're also going to be helped to see what can happen if we lose our focus on what the real purpose of our gospel ministry is. So let's take a look at John. We're going to be in chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 22 and read through verse 30. So 22 through 30 uh, in the NASB. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease." You know what, John's disciples in this passage were confused about the purpose of their ministry. And I I wonder how often we get confused about the same thing. I wonder if you, have you ever been confused about your purpose being a member at Hayden Bible Church? Maybe confused about the end purpose of the activities here at Hayden Bible Church and where maybe you fit in. It's so easy to get sidetracked and it's easy to get focused on subsidiary things. For example, many of us, just as an example, have been sidetracked by the notion that church is just simply a therapeutic organization that exists to help me through my day, and that's it. And so instead of receiving the equipment for ministry, outwardly focused kingdom activities, instead of receiving that equipment for ministry that God supplies by his grace, my approach to church can become boiled down to me just feeling better or just being happy as an end in itself. And honestly, certainly there is rest and peace, sweet peace 
to be found in our Savior Jesus. And he certainly is a gentle and lowly in heart Savior where I can find true rest for my soul. But I need to be careful to understand the fullness of my citizenship in God's kingdom, including my responsibilities as one of his children. And changing metaphors, including my responsibility as the bride in his glorious household. John's disciples were confused about the purpose of their ministry. They worried that Jesus' ministry was more productive than theirs. That his ministry was maybe even at odds with theirs. That, That they thought it was a numbers game. They thought that their perceived difference was grounds for arguing with a fellow Jew about a subsidiary issue. Arguing about some off topic issue. By the way, sometimes when we're arguing for our particular theological position, we can have an attendant, a tendency to exhibit more zeal at times than we do discretion. I wonder if you've ever experienced that. You and I to be, need to be careful to stay focused on what our focus should be. So here's a big idea from, from this passage is the point of John's ministry was to announce the arrival of the bridegroom so that his bride could make herself ready. Christians in all walks of life, Christians in the secular workplace, Christians in the grocery store, Christian missionaries, small group leaders, ministers of reconciliations of all types, all of us in the body of Christ, including you, All of us, the end result of all of our ministry and the purpose of your life as a Christian is to co-labor with God in preparing a bride for his son. To make her ready, to endear her to Christ, her husband. John the Baptist, he had no, absolutely no confusion about this end goal. And I'm hoping you, tonight, we're going to be totally convinced of one thing, that my life your life, but my life will be spent and it must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. Because you and I, we're co-laboring with God to prepare a bride for our great groom. Listen to the same Apostle John describe the marriage of the Supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. He says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Again, my life must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. In other words, as rightly focused members of God's household, our lives will be spent on making disciples of people from everywhere. Remember our commission, guys, to go and to make disciples from all nations, to baptize the disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that he's given us. Because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we can be sure of this as we do this, that he's with us in that work. As long as it takes, even to the end of the age, he's with us in this work. Jesus and his disciples, in tandem with John and his disciples, were doing just that. Preaching the word of God to to bring people to repentance so that they could come to be washed of their sins to the end that they might be come into this endearing, eternal relationship with their bridegroom. God has intended activities that you and I must be involved with in his kingdom. I'm reminded of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. When Paul writes, he says that God gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried around by about 
Every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You and I, guys, we're employed by our Father. We work in His shop, and what a marvelous place to work. Let's look a little bit closer at our passage tonight. First of all, let's remember tonight that we are co-laborers with God in kingdom activities. We are co-laborers with God in kingdom activities. Let's look at verses 22 through 24. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Jesus and his disciples had just been up in Jerusalem and where we had the, the, the privilege of watching and, and, and being the fly on the wall at, during that fascinating encounter with Nicodemus. But now, these guys are headed out into the countryside. And it, and it might not make sense to people like us, to his disciples of today, why he wouldn't have stayed in the largest population center in Judea for his work of ministry. And you can see here that he didn't just simply, like he often did, go off into a quiet place and spend quality time with his father, which, by the way, is instructive of it in itself, but instead here he was active and moving, doing the will of his father, spending time with his disciples and baptizing. The Puritan Matthew Henry talks about Jesus' disciples following him out into the Judean countryside. He recalls Joshua 3, where the Israelites were waiting to cross the Jordan into the land. And the leaders were telling everyone, they said, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, you must leave here and walk behind it. Matthew Henry commented that if the ark remove, it is better to remove and go after it as those did in Joshua 3, then sit still without it, though it be in Jerusalem itself. Jesus' disciples learned in our passage that that it was best to go where Jesus is going and follow him in the work that he's doing. That's the best. And even if that means going into the countryside or away from the population center where it doesn't seem logical that he would go, We, you and I, are co-laborers with God in kingdom activities, with God. And he's the leader. He's the head. We're going to see that he's the husband in charge of his household. By the way, John 4, uh, 1 and 2 tell us that he had commissioned his disciples to the baptizing on his behalf. By his authority, listen to John 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although he himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So that's just a reference back uh, to to give fuller explanation. But anyway, so that while they were baptizing, there was another fruitful ministry taking place up north in Anon near Salim. One of my Bible maps, by the way, shows Salim possibly located kind of in north uh, eastern Samaria, uh, maybe along the Jordan River. The name Anon means place of many springs. John and his disciples were preaching and baptizing there with, where there was lots of water. I was thinking through... <laughs> uh, Uh, It's handy to have lots of water. I know on separate occasions, Pastor Steve and I have both experienced Nepali river baptisms uh, with Raj Kumar in Nepal. And for some reason, uh, for most of the season, the river at Damak, it looks like a plain of river gravel and rock with these small little fingers of water flowing downstream. So when it's time to baptize, Raj actually has these guys. 
And I'm not sure, but this could be a spiritual gift in that part of the world, but these guys that jump into the water and dig a deeper hole so that the people could, could be baptized who've come to Christ. Every, I remember thinking when I was there that it's not going to be deep enough, but they were right, and they had way more experience than me, and it did work, and you could just barely immerse this new believer fully under the water as long as they kind of laid down in the freezing Himalayan Mount Everest runoff water, by the way. John and his disciples, had, they had way more water than that. They, they, Anon was the place. So people were flocking to Jesus. People were flocking to John. John was co-laboring with God in, in this important kingdom work. And, and there was a handoff happening. The king was here, and the prophesied herald was transferring to him. And, and John, we're in that overlap period right now where John is transferring this ministry over. By the way, verse 24, uh, where it says, For John had not yet been thrown into prison, it tells us that these were obviously the days before John was thrown into prison. Eventually, uh, by the way, leading to him being martyred, beheaded by Herod. And, and I, just as a side note, let's, re, let's let verse 24 remind us tonight, peop, uh, friends, that the kingdom work that God has for us at some point could land us in prison. Kingdom work could possibly lead to your death as it did in the case of John the Baptist and many others since then. And for further reading, refer to Hebrews 11, and you'll see many more. But, and as an exhortation for us before things like that happen, the things that we see in John's life, Jesus in, in John 9, 4 says that we must quickly carry about the tasks assigned by us, the one who sent us, because night is coming and then no one can work. So Jesus was about his work, and John was about his work, and they were both preaching the same thing. In fact, in Matthew 3, verse 2, John was crying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Matthew 4, 17, Jesus was crying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Both ministries were ministering a baptism of repentance, and God was at work in both ministries. You and I, guys, are co-laborers with God in kingdom activities. And my life has to be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. I need to stay on that pathway, the pathway ordained by God. Because un unfortunately for most of us, it's easy to get sidetracked off that pathway. And, and John's disciples were vulnerable to the same things that you and I seem to be. For example, comparing ministries comparing levels of giftedness, comparing methods, comparing speaking abilities, pragmatically using earthly strategies like numbers and methods for achieving uh, our heavenly things. Let's look at these next two verses, and let's remember secondly tonight before we look at them that our king, our king, the king is sovereign to produce his kingdom fruit. Let's look closer. Look at 25 and 26. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. It's kind of a strange situation here. John the Baptist's disciples who knew him to be, in a way, the innovator and the initiator of this baptism of repentance ministry, heralding the coming of a king, serving in the exact ministry that the Lord had appointed him to, John's disciples were showing signs that they were kind of covetous of their own ministry, maybe even proud of their system and their authority, and their association with John. There were two primary works of ministry happening, but the original ministry seemed to be losing prominence in their eyes to this secondary ministry of Jesus. In fact, this was likely happening, like it, like it does happen among God's people at times, that was that John's disciples were so proud of their teacher and the merits of their purification achieved through their process 
And their message and their baptism, that their zeal led them into arguments about the inferiority of other peoples, including the Jews' rituals uh, and ministries, which eventually led them to the point of comparing Jesus' ministry with theirs. After all, these guys were the ones who baptized Jesus in the first place, they may have been thinking. Look at Matthew 3 for that. But today, they were concerned that they were being upstaged by Jesus. Why were all these people flocking to him? John, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. But our baptism is better. We are the originals. I'll tell you what, I know from personal experience that confusion about this type of issue can lead to situations just like this, where we focus more on the method or the merits than on the kingdom task at hand, not trusting that our king is sovereign to produce his kingdom fruit. I remember years ago being involved with street preaching, and I remember getting into a mindset during that time that that, that thought, if you're not sharing the gospel like this, then you're not doing it right. If you're not saying these words like I say them, then you probably don't even understand the gospel. If you're not sharing the facts of the gospel in this particular order, then it won't be effective. In fact, it can't be. In fact, like I've shared in the past, if you get sidetracked like this, like, like John's disciples maybe, you can actually derail yourself you could, because you can be focused on the wrong thing. And many of my street preaching partners were so disappointed during that time they, when they compared what they were doing with what others were and were not doing that some of them, they just checked out of church altogether. They kept preaching the gospel, but they left fellowship and thereby fell into sin themselves. When you and I remember that the king is sovereign to produce his kingdom fruit, then we have the right perspective. Getting derailed by comparisons and or methods uh, or merits of methodology gets smaller and smaller, and the kingdom tasks become the center of our pathway. Guys, our lives must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. We have a commission. We can't get sidetracked by marginalizing other people's ministries. Listen, later in John 15, Jesus is teaching his disciples about foundational kingdom truth, and he tells them and says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. God is in charge of the fruitfulness of that other ministry over there, not me. I'm not in charge of that ministry. Paul writes a similar issue in, in, uh, uh, regarding a similar issue in Philippians 1. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Why does he rejoice? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's the power of God. I'm not the power of God. My method isn't the power of God. My ministry isn't the power of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God. You and I, honestly, it boils down to this. We're just fortunate to even be involved. None of us has any grounds for comparing the relative merits of our systems because he has the power. I just show up for work. God is sovereign to produce his kingdom fruit. Our focus is endearing hearts to Christ, witnessing and testifying and praising and glorifying. Let's take a minute to look back at John's godly response to his disciples' concerns. We're going to notice here that for you and I to be effective in ministry, guys, 
We must maintain hearts of humility before our king. To be useful in ministry, I must maintain a humble heart before my king. I have to guard my heart. Listen to verses 27 and 28. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. John is teaching us all in this passage. It takes a humble and contrite place of comparison with Christ to be an effective minister of the gospel. The more others recognize the merits of our ministry, the more we must humble ourselves, even, guys, even as a church. John is like a fortress against the temptations of flattery and and, and applause. And, And these same fortifications prove equally beneficial in our soberness regarding someone else's ministry. Remember the the problems of these types of issues? Remember in another portion of Scripture, they're all over the beginning of 1 Corinthians, aren't they? Remember Paul from chapter 1 in Corinthians, he tells the Corinthians, For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul's? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. To be useful in ministry, I must maintain a humble heart before my king. Jesus teaches us this same heart when he tells his disciples in Luke 17. He says, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. A humble heart before my king recognizes where the fruit comes from. Listen again to Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and 7. He says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Again in 1 Corinthians 15, by, Paul writes, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Even in my efforts, it's the grace of God and his gift that's the one that that is involved in producing the fruit. Like John's disciples, you might think it's you. I might think it's me, but it's not. It's our king. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven, John says. You and I must maintain humble hearts before our king. Not only will this help you out of personal despair about your own fruitfulness in ministry, but also out of abrasive arguments over off-the-pathway issues. Remember, our number one focus tonight is that my life must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. That's our focus. Endearing hearts to the King, to our bridegroom. Let's look at our next two verses, 29 and 30. He, he, John says, you, your, excuse me, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. What a beautiful passage. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Guys, this is the under, this understanding. This understanding is the central focus of the teaching of this passage. And I believe, honestly, it's the central focus of our ministry here at Hayden Bible Church. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. In fact, underline that in your Bible. Highlight it and circle it. 
Because the bride is for the bridegroom. The New Living Translation says, it is the bridegroom who marries the bride. Or the NIV says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. My life must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ alone. Not me, not Hayden Bible Church, not my favorite worship leader, and as crazy as it sounds, not even the Republican Party. The bride has one endearing connection to her groom only. and The bride does not marry your favorite teacher on YouTube. The bride is not called out of the world to marry my favorite teacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones even, as crazy as that might sound. Of course, I mean favorite next to Pastor Steve. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. All of our ministry has this heart at its foundation. And the friend who attends the bridegroom, you and me, John, waits and listens for him with expectation and wonder at his presence and and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. We love to be near him. We love his presence. We love it when he speaks. In fact, he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. John rejoiced greatly at the bridegroom's voice. In fact, to hear his voice was the capstone of his joy. He said to his disciples, This joy of mine is now complete. A bride has greatest affection for her groom. Certainly, in our familiar relationships among people, it would be completely inappropriate for the bride to have romantic affection for any other than her groom. Because he who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's speaking of Christ and the church. And, and there's, just so there's no confusion that you should think errantly about your bridegroom's heart, I want you to know tonight that his heart is also endeared towards you. Our king, our, his, our, our immutable husband's heart is endeared toward his people. You can hear his words in Israel Uh, To Israel in Isaiah 62, he says to Israel, You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her. And your land married, for, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman... So your sons shall marry you, so shall your sons marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. How much more tonight shall our king, our groom, our husband rejoice over his church? Who else? Who else should have our deepest affection? To to whom else other than Christ should your heart be endeared? To whom else should your loved ones or your neighbors or your co-workers give their deepest heart affection? Shouldn't it be to the bridegroom? Isn't it he who has the bride? If, If he redeemed her with his own blood, shouldn't he have his full reward? Listen, guys, you and I would do well to make certain that our hearts are prepared like John's. Listen as we close here to verse 30. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. John knew that when the king arrived and and when his great name had been proclaimed and he had pointed others to him that his ministry, John's ministry, would be transferred to the Messiah. You know what, maybe it was you that made the first connection with that family next door. Maybe you gave them three or four rolls of toilet paper right next door, and that was your entry into their lives. And you started testifying about the sweetness of the voice of your Savior, and you shared the wonderful news of the gospel, and they came to Him. They believed because they belong to Him. 
Let the transfer take place. Because he who has the bride is the bridegroom. You, your job is to just rejoice at the sound of his voice. Our place is to simply listen to him for our next instruction. My life must be spent on endearing hearts to Christ. That's the purpose of my whole existence. You and I, we're co-laborers with God in kingdom activities. Our king is sovereign to produce fruit, his kingdom fruit. To be useful in ministry, I must maintain a humble heart before my king. So guys, tonight in your neighborhood, in your sequester, uh, wherever you are tonight, let's serve him. And, And knowing that he must increase, but I must decrease. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the way that you've called us, each of us, Lord. You've, in this amazing way that you've, you've gone into the world and plucked us out, called us out individually, out of the world, this world of darkness. And you've placed us over here to be used for your special purpose, this purpose of making disciples in your kingdom. Lord, what a wonderful blessing that is, that you even allow us to be involved with that ministry. And Lord, today, even as we're uh, walking through this weirdness of this pandemic, Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways that we never expected. And today, Lord, as we go on through the week and we consider these words uh, in John chapter 3, Lord, we pray that these words, Lord, these instructions, these truths from this passage would inform the way that we interact with other people. Lord, we want to be part of endearing the hearts of others to a Savior, to their husband, Jesus. Lord, help us to be fruitful in that ministry. Open doors for us, even though we're shut-ins in some ways. Uh, Lord, be glorified and pleased and blessed by our lives that we walk before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you washed in the blood? Go. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? blood of the Lamb. Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments Spotless are they white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, when the bridegroom cometh, the robes be white. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's cry and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white 
as snow are you washed in the blood of land who lay aside those garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the land there's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean are you washed in the blood of the land who are you In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb All your garments spotless are they white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? God bless you. Now go and be His hands and feet.